Uh, welcome to the uh, Advanced Chemical Kinetics section. Um, my name is Bill Green. I'm going to introduce uh, the lecturer, uh, Dr. Stephen Klippenstein. Um, Stephen uh, grew up in Vancouver, Canada, and attended the University of British Columbia, where he uh, earned double degrees in mathematics and chemistry. He then went to Caltech, where he earned his PhD uh, with Rudy Marcus. Um, those of you who are chemists will know that Rudy won the Nobel Prize in chemistry, uh, though not for work that he did with Steve. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Stephen and I are exact contemporaries, and uh, by good fortune for both of us, we happen to work on the same problem, uh, which ended very well for both of us. Um, and so uh, I, I lucked into some really nice experiments uh, that kind of proved this theory was right, and, uh, and he was able to explain my experiments very well, so that was very nice. Um, Stephen earned his, his PhD in uh, 1988. Um, then he did a postdoc with Casey Hines at the University of Colorado Boulder, and then uh, started as a faculty member at Case Western Reserve, um, where he was for about 11 years. Um, after that, he decided he liked the National Lab life better, and he uh, moved to Sandia National Lab in uh, Livermore for about five years, and then uh, to Argonne National Lab in 2005, where he is now a distinguished fellow of theoretical chemistry. Um, Stephen uh, more or less wrote the book on how to compute uh, certain kinds of rate coefficients, especially barrierless reactions um, and uh, roaming reactions and also uh, uh, made key advances in how to compute pressure-dependent rate coefficients uh, with a lot of attention to chemically activated reaction systems, many of them very important for combustion. Um, he computes rate coefficients for uh, combustion reactions, also for atmospheric and uh, um, space chemistry uh, reactions in uh, interstellar space and also, I think, in Titan as well. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Um, uh, Stephen's work has been extremely influential in this field, and you're, you're getting the word uh, straight from the horse's mouth here. Um, he's, uh, um, his papers have been cited more than 13,000 times, um, and 35 of his papers have been cited more than 100 times. Um, he gave uh, one of the plenary lectures at the uh, last combustion symposium in Korea. And without any further ado, welcome Stephen. Thank you, Bill. I think that might be the nicest introduction I've ever had. <laughs> I, I certainly do, as well as you have very fond memories of our, of our first interaction together way back when on Keating Dissociation. Bill had done some just beautiful experiments on, on, on energy resolved photo dissociation. No, nobody has really since then come back and done that level of, of, of resolution of a photo dissociation process. And they really provided some great fodder for developing theory. Um, I'm going to start with, with, with a question that's just going to start, that, that alienate most of us probably, but I just want to get a sense anyways. How many in the room here are not engineers? Is there anybody in the room here that's not an engineer? Yeah, there's one. <laughs> so so I'm, going to, I'm going, to be, going to be coming at you from a different perspective. As, as Bill says, my background is chemistry and math, and then chemistry and then a chemistry department. And now I'm in What do I do? Uh, he's probably got a little bit of a sense from, from my, my title and so on. I'm purely a theoretician, okay? O only look at things theoretically. And what I really do is a combination of chemistry, physics, math, computer science, and engineering, right? Well, I have no background in engineering, so I don't really know. The, the, my, my engineering is to, is to collaborate with people like yourselves telling me what reactions are important telling me what we should be trying to learn. Uh, there's been a tremendous progress, tremendous advance in how well we can calculate rate constants. And so there's, 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 there's a, a, a sort of transition happening. We're in the midst of it happening where people like me are doing rate constants one by one, and now the you engineers want to get them for the thousands of reactions in your mechanism. You want to start learning some of these methods that, that we've been developing and, and, and generating and start start doing it at a much grander scale and, 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 try and, and, and try and introduce and improve the accuracy of chemical mechanisms by doing lots and lots of rate calculations as opposed to the, to the one or two that, that I tend to do. So my background is very fundamental, trying to really get as good a rate constant as possible. 
And that's what I'm going to tell you a lot about. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a huge applicability to, to engineering things and that you can't learn some of what you would be doing in engineering from what I tell you. My, my view is you're going to do your best calculations, whether they're single rate calculations or hundreds of rate calculations, if you actually understand the fundamentals. So I'm going to try and start with the fundamentals and work towards really telling you how to do more applied things. But I, I think it's important for you to hear and think about some of those fundamentals. Understanding those tells you where to put energy in and as you try to improve things and, and, and really let, lets you use your, things, your, your, your efforts more effectively. Okay. Combustion science is, is, is really a fantastic science in the sense that it's really the classic multi-scale modeling problem. And it's probably the, 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 the multi-scale modeling problem where we've made the most progress at going right from the very beginning, electrons, all the way to modeling devices. We have good treatments of all levels, and we're putting all of those levels together in, in, in final things. Like now, nowadays, people are doing high-level CFD simulations of actual devices. The person I know that Argon, Subindu Som, is, is doing real simulations of, of a piston moving up and down and, 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 and the combustion events that are going on in the, as that piston moves up and down. Somebody at Sandia, Jackie Chen, does DNS of, 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 of re, real combustion, not so much with, with moving geometries yet, but they're moving towards that. And one of the advances in science that's happening that we're in the midst of, 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 of going on that you guys will probably have a lot to do with is um, a, a, a change in the scale of computing. Computational fluid dynamics is, is historically one of, the, one of the great testing beds for large-scale parallelism. And recently, we're talking about going to what they like to call exascale computing, another factor of, of a thousand larger scale, a hundred to a thousand scale larger. And there's quite a bit of, of, of funding for that. That's coming about. This is one of these sad political realities, why there is funding for that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make, make a racist comment here. This is just reality. One of the things that's going on in government is that, that, that we want to compete with the Chinese society, right? And, and the Chinese are building bigger supercomputers. Therefore, the government is happy to give money to build exascale computing. Combustion is, is a great place to do some of, some of that research. And so we're getting funding to do exascale computing. Uh, historically, as I said, that's all to do with CFD. It turns out that they also have put Bill and, and, and me and some others on a project to try and advance the chemistry mechanisms. One of the, one, of the, one of the points that I like to make is that when you look at the chemistry parts of the problem, they've been historically done with small-scale computing, uh, thousands of, a thousand times less than what we do in CFD. And yet they might actually be the bottleneck to getting accuracy in the end of, of what you're trying to model. And so there's a need for changing the scale of computing that you use in the chemistry, that, in chemical kinetics that you do. And I'm going to try and tell you some of the things that we're doing that you can do to try and uh, make better utility of, of, of available resources. We don't, we don't, as a chemical kinetics community, make, anywhere, make very effective use. And I include myself in, in, in that statement. So, so I say it's a multi-scale problem. I start at this end. I've been talking a little bit about starting at this end with device modeling. I start at this end. I want to start by thinking about electrons. All right, we have to understand how the electrons move. Because as the electrons move, that determines what your forces on your nuclei are. And then your nuclei move according to, to, the, to the forces provided by the electrons. You get a bunch of nuclei moving together and you get some kind of, uh, of rate processes that can happen. And you start by trying to understand the rate processes for, 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 for just sort of a single collision between two molecules. And then you say, oh, but we've got lots of different collisions and, and, and that, and that uh, uh, reactive complex you might form in the first collision will suffer more, more collisions with bath gas. And then you start to think about things at a macroscopic level. To do that, we have to think about master equations. And once we've got, once we've got uh, sort of these phenomenological rate cons, we say, well, we don't need one. We need to model thousands of rate cons. So we put, put all those together, and we get a chemical mechanism. And then that chemical mechanism is the input for your reacting flow 
simulations. At a simple level, you're just doing sort of simple geometries that don't depend much on the flow, and then you can get things like ignition delays, flame speeds, and species profile. And this is basically the point I, I sort of understand things up to. And then but what, but what you really want to do is after you've got really good mechanisms, take them and put them into the, the overall device simulation. So I'm going to try and take you through from the beginning from electrons through to thinking about many different reactions. I think Bill's been telling you th things that, that, are, that, are, that are going to go into more detail on the sort of overview. I'm going to really dig into the, the details of, 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 of this. Just to get you oriented, here's a sample of the, the number of reactions and number of species you have to think about in, in typical mechanism. This is a little bit old, maybe almost 10 years now, but things haven't really changed much. If you have small molecules, you have on the order of a, a couple hundred uh, reactions you need to think about. By the time you get to, to uh, practically interesting fuels, you have to get on the order of 10,000 reactions just to get a sort of semi-decent mechanism. Most of my work is centered around doing things at this end of the scale. The, thing, the methods I'll tell you about, you can still apply to bigger things. I just tend to focus on these to try and get really high accuracy and to try and understand the accuracy. An important part of mechanism development is that, is that mechanisms are very hierarchical. What does that mean? If you take a big a mechanism for a C16 alkane, it will break down basically in, into mechanisms for these small molecules and you have to really understand those. Your, your biggest uncertainties will actually come from the hydrogen oxygen mechanism, which is, would be down there somewhere. And, and so the, 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 to get accuracy for your larger ones, you have, to get, you have to build the accuracy up from all the small ones that your, that your big fuel breaks down into. And so there's a lot of, of value to getting high accuracy numbers for the, for the core parts of your mechanism. This is the project I told you about that, that Bill and I are, are part of. And it's a, it's, a, it's a procedure where what we're trying to do is apply theory to evaluate the rate constants and the thermal chemistry for basically every species in those mechanisms that, that, that you would You pick a specific fuel, and we hope to be able to have a code that will automatically generate all the parameters at a high degree of accuracy for every part of that mechanism. Actually, Matt Johnson here is part of our team. No, is there anybody else? I can't say your name. You, Yang, Yang, you, you pay or something? You pay? All right. Good. I'm sorry. I, I have a problem with foreign names. My flaw. Sorry. All right. So, so, so this is something we're trying to get to. Uh, but it, once we get this sort of iterative loop to try and improve the mechanisms that, that Bill Green Group makes with the RMG, then, then, we can, then we can start taking our simulations and pass them off to the, to the uh, simulation, the fluid dynamic simulations. So I've tried to break our, our lectures into, into three subcomponents. The first thing, we have to understand electronic structure theory. And, 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 and I'm going to start, in all these bases, I'm going to start by talking a lot about theory and then a little bit about what you can do with the theory, okay? Electronic structure is going to be particularly heavy in theory. There's a lot of acronyms, a lot of sort of basic things you have to understand before you can understand those acronyms. I, I can't really do justice to it in, in three lectures, but I'm going to try and give you some sense of what the words mean so you can have some qualitative understanding. Uh, and to this first lecture, I'm really just going to try and go through Hartree-Fock and, and single reference methods. And then the next lecture uh, in this afternoon goes through density functional theory and then through composite methods and, and multi-reference electronic structure theory. These are just sort of increasing in, in level of, of complexity. The next day I'll talk about pressure independent rate theory, trying to basically think about microcanonical rate constants and thermal averages of microcanonical rate constants. As Bill said, I've done a lot of work on treating barrierless reactions. A lot of the reactions that happen in a, that go on in a combustion system are barrierless, radical, radical reactions. They just, two species come together without any barrier. You call that a, a barrierless reaction. Uh, and then the last day, we'll talk about pressure dependent kinetics in the master equation. Things get, get more complicated there, and, and we actually st will start to see that, that they really need to think about things beyond what you think of as a standard kinetic. Uh, methodologies. One of the exciting things for me as a fundamental chemist is we learn that the ways that people model things are fundamentally flawed. And the way we learn that 
is because we, we, we get to the point where the rate constants we have have such high accuracy that you can't just jimmy them to try and reproduce the experimental observation. So from my perspective, when we've got a model that disagrees with an experimental observation, that's exciting because it's telling us that there's something flawed in, in your mechanism. One of, the, one of the interesting flaws, to me what's, what's a really, real interesting flaw, is, is an, an assumption that's sort of at the foundation of all chemical modeling that people do in combustion. And that is that all of your species are thermalized before they react. We have evidence that that's not true and that it affects your, your macroscopic observables. And one of, the, one of the interesting things to think about as we go forward is how do we deal with that in, in a large scale simulation. But that, that's the kind of fun we get to from a fundamental perspective. I, I'm obligated to tell you about funding and, 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 and acknowledge funding sources. DOE has been very generous to me with various kinds of funding. Uh, our core pro program at, at Argonne is called the Gas Phase Chemical Physics Program. Wade Sisk is our program ma monitor. He is giving a lot of support for that. We do a lot of code development work. We don't just use standard codes. We write our own codes to do these transition state theory calculations. I use all standard codes to do electronic structure calculations. Electronic structure theory is a very complex and difficult task. To write a good electronic structure code is uh, multi-person, multi-year, you know, on the order of 100 man hours to make a decent, 100 man years to make a decent electronic structure code. I don't do any work on that area. But we do all, a lot of our own transition state theory and kinetics code program. Uh, we, we like to think a lot about low temperature oxidation. That's where some interesting deviations from these kinetic, uh, standard kinetic ideas arise. We have a special grant that where we collaborate with Sandia to, to work on low temperature oxidation, and particularly thinking about it from the, at the pressures of relevance to combustion. And then uh, not so long ago, I was part of a combustion ERHRC that Professor Law was leading, and that provided motivation for a lot of our developments. And most recently, as I said, we've gotten funding now to start doing this exascale computing with funding from DOE Oscar. I have a lot of collaborators. Uh, I, ha I have really fortunate to have really smart people working with me on the theoretical side. Electronic structure theory. Larry Harding, his whole background is electronic structure theory. My theory is in, in transition state theory, in essence. And, and I only learned electronic structure theory because I needed to to do with the calculations. Larry Harding is a real world expert at, at multi-reference electronic structure calculations, which are the most complicated kind of electronic structure calculations. Uh, Jim Miller uh, is one of the primary uh, developers of Chemkin. He didn't do much of the coding, but he did a lot of the, of the, of the suggesting of, of how to develop things and, 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 and where it can go. Uh, many of you, if you haven't used Chemkin, probably will at some point in your career, at least if you do any kind of, of, of modeling. Yuri Georgievsky is, is a senior research associate with me. He's a real expert at, at, at chemical physics, programming, and, and just understanding the mathematical and, and physical concepts behind things. He has written most of the programs that I'll describe to you today. Aaron Jasper is an expert at chemical dynamics, trajectory simulations, and he's been looking a lot at energy transfer. Raghu Sivaramakrishnan is, is a, a, a chemical modeler, and he's been working substantially with us with, to, to provide motivation for specific studies. So these five people are all at Argonne. I also collaborate a lot with Peter Glarborg at Danish Technical University. And then I've had a lot of postdocs and, and students and, and visiting faculty. I'll, I'll point out here, Mike Burke and Franklin Goldsmith were, were really key postdocs that, that have driven a lot of my work forward in the last five or 10 years. They've now gone on to faculty positions, Mike Burke at Columbia and, and Franklin Goldsmith at Brown. Nicole Labbe was, was Raghu Sivaraman Krishnan's postdoc, and she's now at University of Colorado. And these are a, a number of other postdocs who've had uh, been part of the lab. I'll point out Marco Verdicchio did a lot of work with us on, on 2D master equations that we haven't yet had a chance to, to publish. Uh, some students, I, we're not allowed to have graduate students at Argonne, but, but a lot of people send their graduate students to come and visit us for a number of months or, or, or a year, and we've had uh, lots of nice contributions from them. Sarah Elliott is now visiting us from Georgia, working on this exascale project, trying to help us to program things out. Malta Dantjen visited us from, from Aachen, and he worked on looking at dimethyl ether oxidation, and Kenley Pelser worked on the 2D master equation. 
uh, developed the code for us to do the 2D master equation, which is, is, a, is a nice advance for thinking about pressure dependence. I've had the privilege of having a, a number of, of great faculty come and visit me. I'm going to tell you something ab about a code that we call ES to KTP, Electronic Structure to Temperature and Pressure Dependent Rate Constants. Carlo Cavallotti started working on that code when he came to visit me on, on a sabbatical, and, 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 and we're going to release that code very soon. Uh, Alex Mebel came and visited me and worked a lot on, on PAH. Baptiste Wallen, Jolland came and is working on astrochemistry things. Andre Nicole came and worked a lot on toluene oxidation and Feng Shang as well. All right, so let's get into look, thinking about electronic structure theory. The Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Just to make sure we're, we're on the same page, we should start with the very beginning assumption, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Electrons are much, much lighter than, than protons and neutrons and the nuclei. One two thousandth the mass of a proton. The end result of that is that electrons are moving much, much more rapidly than the nuclei. And so you've got this nuclei moving around, this nucleus moving around, and you've got these electrons flying around it, and, and, it's, and they, they sort of adiabatically following the nuclei around. And it's important to understand that that's how things are. That adiabatic approximation is at the core of everything you do in molecular modeling. Okay? The, the electrons are flying around it, and, and, and those electrons flying around it are, de are actually determining the forces for the nuclei. You have one nucleus here, another nucleus here. You've got different sets of electrons flying around, and the interactions of the elect of electron on one nucleus affect how the other nucleus moves, and vice versa. And, and they're not really even localized to one nucleus. They're spread amongst them. And it's that overall interaction between the electrons flying around the nucleus and, 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 and the, is what causes the, the particular motions of, of, of the nuclei. So with that idea that they're moving much faster, that they're, that they're adiabatically adjusting to where the position of the nuclei is, allows you to separate your proper Schrodinger equation into a Schrodinger equation for electronic motions and a Schrodinger equation for nuclear motion. What does that mean? We take the nuclei, put them at some position. We fix the, fix the position of the nuclei, some kind of bond length, bond length, bond orientation. We've got a fixed orientation structure of our molecule. We solve the electronic Schrodinger equation, the electronic part of the Schrodinger equation for that fixed geometry, and that will give us an energy. We're usually interested in just the ground state energy. Just the lowest energy. Remember when you solve Schrodinger equations, you get any number of quantized energy levels. The electronic part, we're just interested in the ground energy usually. That ground energy, if you think about taking the derivative of that with respect to your nuclear positions, gives you a force, it gives you a, 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 a force that forces the derivative of that potential. And that force is what determines then how your nuclei move. And so if we want to so propagate nuclei, if we think of them as classical objects, we just keep re repeatedly calculating this electronic energy, taking its derivative, and then propagate according to, to Hamilton's mo uh, to, to Newton's equations of motion. And, and you can get a, a reasonable approximation to, to how nuclei move. That sort of classical treatment of nuclei is never useful for electrons. Electrons, you have to think about them from the Schrodinger equation. You think about the usual wave-particle duality. You have to think about electrons as waves. I like to think of electrons as waves. I like to think of, of nuclei as particles. And particles are sort of the classical object, and electrons are the quantum. You have to think of electrons quantum mechanically. You think of finding this ground energy for them, and then thinking about taking that derivative and defining how your nuclei move. It turns out the nuclei you can't, e e can't either treat as classical objects. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. They sort of are on the border between, between the importance of qu quantum mechanics and not. If you think about what everybody does in protein folding and so on, they think about everything as purely classically, usually. There, there's some progress in starting to worry about quantum effects even in there. But the reality is, if you're at low temperature, quantum mechanics is pretty important. One of the, one of the 
if, if you're at higher temperatures, you start to have many states, and you have start to have enough states that some kind of classical treatments are, 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 are right. And so you're kind of in, in this border, specifically within combustion, and trying to make effective use of, of the classical uh, parts of the, of the parts of the problem that are well modeled with classical is part of doing good calculations. Uh, trying to do everything quantum mechanically is, 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 for the nuclei is, is difficult and, 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 and mostly not, not needed. Now I said so far we're, we're interested in the ground electronic state. But at some geometries you'll find that there are two, two different electronic configurations that will have almost the same energy. You call, call that you, degeneracy. You have two electronic states, the same energy. The, 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 the Schrodinger equation has two solutions that are almost the same number. When that happens, it creates all sorts of troubles, both for doing the, the calculation of the electronic wave function and for also, also for thinking about the dynamics. Almost always when you're thinking about a transition state, a transition state corresponds to a crossing between two separate electronic states. You've got two states that have become nearly degenerate. Usually those states interact and so you end up with still a splitting between the two states and everything's fine, but sometimes they don't interact and then you have real crossings and you have to be, or you have only a very small splitting and you have to worry about whether you're going to follow one electronic state and end up being excited in the electronic states or not. That's the kind of thing that you call non-adiabatic dynamics or inter-system crossing. Those kind of things all come about when you have non-degenerate. I'm going to basically avoid these problems as much as possible, almost completely. But, they're, but the, the understand that they are really the, sort of the thing that gives rise to transition states. It's the fact that two, straight, two states are, are, are more or less crossing. All right, let's start, let's start now with the, the simplest possible way to, to do electronic structure theory. Uh, uh, the, the standard, uh, I shouldn't say simple, the standard way to do electronic structure theory is, is something that you, you could call wave function theory. We try to find the wave functions. And almost all of these wave function theories start from what they, what's called the Hartree-Fock approximation. And it's a particularly very simple sort of mean field approximation. I'll go into more detail what that is and, and, and try and explain that to you. When, when you do these, you have to do expansions and you can't really get the absolute answer, so you make some kind of expansions in basis sets and try and figure out how things vary with the basis set. You can go then be, build from this Hartree-Fock in various different ways, and that's what I'm going to try and take you through here is MP2 perturbation theory, uh, configuration interaction with singles and doubles or, or more and coupled cluster theory. These are three different approaches for going beyond the Hartree-Fock approximation. This CCSD parentheses T has become the gold standard for doing electronic structure theory. But by being the gold standard, it's also pretty expensive. And so uh, you, it's, 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 it's what we do, but we don't do it at the first stage of the calculation. We'll start with simpler things at the first stage. We've got to get better basis sets. One particularly useful kind of basis set is something called correlation consistent basis sets. I want to tell you a little bit about that. And then a, a new approach to doing electronic structure is something called density functional theory. Uh, density functional, instead of thinking about the wave function, you think about the density, basically the, the square of the, of the wave function, which doesn't sound all that different, but it turns out to, to give you completely different equations and ways to think about it. And there's been a real revolution in that basically over, over the time period of, of my career. In, in, the, in the early 90s, the mid 90s on to now, there's just been continuing exciting new results coming out of density functional theory. It's a great way to get pretty accurate results very quickly, but it's very hard to get really high accuracy with this method. To get really high accuracy, you go back to some of these single reference methods. And I'm going to start by them by trying to tell you about those single reference methods. These are just two books that, that, that or give you a nice overview. I learned my quantum chemistry by reading this particular book, and I think it's a pretty good one. It's pretty mathematical, but then electronic structure theory is a pretty mathematical subject, and most of you as engineers probably don't have much problem with math. I think this is a good book, but I can't say that I've actually looked at that one very closely. I think, it, in my mind, it's kind of a travesty that we don't have a requirement that essentially everybody learn what quantum chemistry is because all of molecular engineering, molecular, et cetera, is based on understanding what electronic wave functions are 
and 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 there's there's just huge need and huge utility of it in essentially every area of anything that involves molecular modeling, which is a very large fraction. But I, I know that very few of you will have ever heard of will ever have done any of what I was talking about there. So, so I, my point of saying that is I would encourage you for your own intellectual benefit to read one of those books. Actually try and learn what electronic structure theory is. All right, so let's start with the Hartree-Fock approximation. The standard Schrodinger equation, right? It doesn't, uh, uh, the H psi equals E psi. I've replaced E with V because this E is going to be the potential for our nuclei later. We're just looking at the electronic part of the Schrodinger equation. The electronic part of the Schrodinger equation, we write down our, our Hamiltonian as a sum of kinetics and, and, and uh, potential terms. Hamiltonian is just another word for energy, but, but just with energy represented as operators. So just think of these as energy. So this first term may not look like to you, but that's the kinetic energy expression. This term is the term for the interaction between the electrons and the nuclei. This term is the term for the interaction between the electrons, one electron with another electron. And this term is the term for the interaction between the two nuclei. This term is trivial and just drops out of the equation, because remember, we're thinking about this for fixed capital R. Capital R is the nuclear distances. Little r are the electron distances. So this is just simply writing down the energy here. How one goes about solving this then, you make a, a, a first approximation, which is you say your wave function is a product of n different orbitals each orbital is meant to qualitatively describe one of your electrons. If you have n electrons, you've got n orbitals. And so we're going to try and get approximate, we're going to try and, and get reasonable representations for each of these orbitals. But we assume each, we assume that our wave function is just a product of them. And in reality, it's a little bit more complicated than that. I've, I've put these, what look like absolute value signs around it. It means that it's a Slater determinant, which means that it's some complicated determine of these, but we don't need to worry about that. Just let, let's just ignore that for now, right? But if you want to do, be precise, we've got to, but that would take us another week to understand. Qualitatively, the physical idea is one orbital per electron. Okay. So if you, if you have a simple atom, you have an orbital for your 1s electrons, and your 2s electrons, and then you have another one for the other 1s, and then you have another one for the 2s, another one for the second 2s, and so on. And you go through all of your electrons until you've put them all in different orbitals. With a molecule, things get more complicated. You, you can still think of it at first as, as, as atomic orbitals on each one, but now some of those electrons start to spend, if you, if you have a diatomic for them, some of the electrons start to spend their time being shared between the two nuclei. They go back and forth between them. And so now your orbital needs to, t needs to look something like a, a combination of, of those two orbitals. You, you call that combination a molecular orbital. So we have to get more and more complicated orbitals as we get more and more complicated treatments of, of, our, of our molecule. But basically, we're, we're putting each electron into one orbital. Then we develop what's called a self-consistent field treatment of it, it's a mean field treatment. You think of, all right, we've, we've got this molecule. Let's say we've got a diatom. We've got all these electrons moving around here. Now we're going to pick one electron on that, and we're going to think about what its potential energy terms are in that. Its potential energy term depends on where the other electrons are. But those other electrons are waves, which makes for it complicated. You can't just say it's, it's a single thing. And so we, we, we take some, we, we, we say, OK, well, let's assume we've already solved the Schrodinger equation for all these other electrons. And then we can average the interaction of this electron with these wave descriptions of all the other electrons and get some kind of, kind of, of description of things, a mean field description, a mean average over all these diff different ways of putting the electrons. All right. Yes? You said you were, we were assuming you have 31 electrons per orbital, but yes. uh, if in reality there are two uh, electrons in opposite strings on the same orbital, then we're separating the orbitals. So, 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 so you, you, you've asked a, a good question. I'm sorry. Let, I'm supposed to repeat your questions. Yeah. Your, her question is, 
Well, I said there's one per orbital, but aren't there two per orbital because you know, you've got alpha and beta, you've got up and down spins for every orbital? And, and that's a good question. That, 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 that in turn, uh, turns out to be at the heart of this thing that I was trying to avoid. We've, we've got this Slater determinant here, and that Slater determinant includes not just spatial orbitals, but spin orbitals. And so then you, if, you, if you think of your proper orbital as a combination of space and spin, then there's one orbital per each one. If you think about it just as space, then there's either one or two per, 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 per thing. Right. So, so yes, properly going through the mathematics deals with, with things, but qualitatively you can still think of it as I'm saying, it, it, one, one electron per orbital, and then I'm just calling it a, a, a combination of spin and space for that orbital but I'm not talking about the spin part of it, just to make my life easy. So that just complicates the math. You have to worry about alphas and betas and, and all sorts of uh, and these determinant aspects. But the physics is, is, is really correct. With, we're thinking about here, this, uh, this, for, for this particular uh, orbital, this particular electron, we get a mean field. We just iterate through these equations, right? I, I said it's going to depend on having solved for all the other uh, electrons, all right? And so, so we first get some approximation, whatever it is, and that then tells us what the mean field is for each electron as we go through, and then that gives us a new set of orbitals, and we just keep going back and forth until we found a, a solution that's self-consistent. And so this whole approach, some, uh, you usually call it Hartree-Fock. Another equally good word for it is self-consistent field theory, and those are sort of two synonyms for the same thing. We get a self-consistent determination of this mean potential energy and these orbitals for, for things. This is the basis of everything that people do with standard wave function theory, this Hartree-Fock self-consistent field theory. It's a, it's a, it's a big approximation. To, to assume that you can just do things in, in this sort of separable way with, with mean fields. The real thing is much more complicated, but it's a, good, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good starting approximation. It's a good conceptual approximation. It gets you started. All right, so now we have to start thinking about these, these orbitals. They're really, as I said, not just atomic orbitals. They're molecular orbitals. We start with, you know, if you have a diatomic, you've got an electron that's shared, it's some combination of the atomic orbitals on, on both of them in, in some sense. And so we, we expand our spatial orbitals, our molecular orbitals, with coefficients times some sort of standard atomic orbitals. You, you should know atomic orbitals, solving for the H atom, you get a bunch of 1s, 2s, 2p, and so on. You can do that really for any atom, you can get pretty good atomic orbitals, uh, simple description of the Schrodinger equation. So, so you're imagining these are, these are those solutions of your atomic orbitals, and you're going to represent it as an expansion in terms of those. It turns out that we don't like to use the proper mm, numerical, the proper analytic description of, of atomic orbitals. It causes problems mathematically. It's, it can be done, but it's more effective to, to, to write things in terms of Gaussians. So we have everything in terms of, of R squared. And so we take our atomic orbitals and we span, expand them in Gaussian basis sets. It's just a, something that's done for mathematical convenience. There's a bunch of integrals, you know, many, many integrals, 10 to the, 10 to the 10th integrals that you'll do in, in some standard electronic structure calculations by expanding them in these Gaussians rather than in the standard uh, atomic orbital description you get a, a more efficient determination of, of some integrals. So basically, though, the point is your molecular orbitals is an expansion in atomic orbitals, which are expansions in basis sets. And so a lot of our discussion is going to be about how do you get convergence with respect to basis sets. The more basis functions you have, the better you'll be able to describe these atomic orbitals. And the more atomic orbitals you have, the better you'll be able to get a description, a better uh, molecular orbital you'll be able to get. You might think you only need to define the orbitals that are acu actually occupied. You have to actually really be able to describe uh, other things so that you can add flexibility to your description. And those gives you uh, uh, what are called polarization functions and diffuse functions. Diffuse functions are good for treating uh, ionic effects, uh, uh, in particular, and, 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 and sort of 
long range effects. And polarizations are useful for determining orientational dependence of your basis sets. Quantum chemistry started with um, started. Uh, John Popel was one of the primary people to, to, to make electronic structure theory popular. He wrote something called a, a code called Gaussian. And Gaussian was a, was a freeware software from the 70s and going on up, up until this day that made it so that you could, that, that anybody could just put in a simple input and run an electronic structure calculation. So he, John Popel was, was the one that really popularized electronic structure theory, this standard wave function theory thing. He won the Nobel Prize in 1998 for his contribution to our understanding of electronic structure. It was much more than just popularizing. He was really developing valuable methods and so, so on. But for our purposes, we just understand that he really popularized things. He defined a whole bunch of standard basis sets. One of the, back in the, in the 70s, what would be common would be to do something with some, what we call STO 3G, Slater type orbitals and three Gaussians. Nobody uses this anymore, or, or very few people, maybe in some trivial part of your initial calculation. It's too small. Next step up was to do what was called 3 2 1 g and now and then 6 2 1 g 6 2 1 g star is still routinely used to do some kind of starting calculation. It won't give you any kind of accuracy, but it, it will give you generally the, the qualitatively right description of a system. Maybe you have to add a, a diffuse function, which means you put a plus sign here. But, but in general, it gives you the right qualitative description of your system. So this is a good starting basis set that, that for, for doing things. It include, the star means it includes polarization function. As I said, putting these plus signs means it includes diffuse function. And, 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 and you can keep going larger and larger, and, and that's what these symbols here mean. These basis sets for quantitative calculations have largely been superseded, and I'll get to that in a minute. We want to get beyond the Hartree-Fock approximation and the mean field approximation. How do we do that? We have to make our wave function more general. We started with an assumption that our wave function was just a product of these orbitals for each different electron. Well, that's, a, that's an approximation. That, that, that doesn't give you full flexibility. What you need to do is to, uh, one way to, 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 to get more general is to imagine taking your starting description and imagine moving any one of these electrons from this, or from its starting orbital to some other higher lying orbital. Right? So you imagine making excitations of any one of your electrons to a, to a higher level. That's called a singly excited. So maybe you started with with an with a electron on your carbon atom that's in a it's in a two p orbital, and now you imagine exciting that to a three p orbital. Well, that's not really the the, the, the stable state of, of matter. But it, mathematically, it contributes to finding your variationally minimum state, variational minimal energy. And, and so it really does contribute to, to, to f properly finding the, the solution to your Schrodinger equation. You can imagine doing that with more and more. I talked about doing that with just one electron. Now imagine you took two of your electrons and excited two electrons. So this is the, the, from the uh, first orbital to the s orbital and the second orbital to the r orbital. Right? And, and you can take any pair of them and excite them to, to other orbitals. And that will give you your doubly excited configurations. And those doubly excited configurations will also make some modest effect on, on, the, on your energy that you estimate from the Schrodinger equation. This is an obvious series, right? You can do triply excited, quadruply excited, et cetera. There is an end to this series. Once you've got all n electrons in any possible orbital, then you've done all possible combinations, and you will get the proper solution to the Schrodinger equation. That's called full CI. Full CI is impossible for anything more than sort of water and, and a really small basis set. 
It's not quite true, but basically it's very, very hard to do it. You, for water, you already have to do, you'll have to think about millions of configuration or billions of configuration. So it's just way too expensive to do routinely. But it's, a, it's the, the logical progression of the sequence, and it's a good, it, it, doing it for small systems is a good way for testing your approximations. What is commonly done is just worry about the single and double excitations. Take either one or two electrons from your, from your reference configuration, from your Hartree-Fock configuration, and excite them up to some other orbitals. If we then solve these uh, equations with, with just these single and double excitations, we get what's called CI singles and doubles. If we take those one and two electron excitations and just do perturbation treatment of it, then we get what's called MP2. So MP2 is like CI singles and doubles, but it's just doing a perturbative treatment of it rather than the full, full numerical solution of it. So it's going to be more approximate, but, but it has some advantages. Coupled cluster theory does, does the same kind of thing, but it, it, it actually builds out to infinite order some other higher level excitations. And we'll talk a little bit about that too in a minute. Let's think about the simplest one of those first, MP2. Yes? If you're, if, I'm sorry, his question is if, now, instead of just talking about one species, let's talk about a big mechanism. What do we do for, for, for a big mechanism, if I'm interpreting your question? Right. So in an, in an ideal world, what you want to do is, is build up some method that you can apply to, the, to, the, to all this, to the species of interest in your mechanism, and you want to, you want to have applied that same approach to a simpler kind of reaction a smaller thing, but, but say, in the same, say the same class, and then you want to try and correlate the errors that you made if you use that approximate method on the small one with, with, if you did a good calculation on the small one. And so then you can build your way up to doing the whole big system and accurate and sort of validate things along the way. So, uh, MP2 is, is what I call second order perturbation theory. I don't really want to go through the, the math, but it's basically your energy becomes a Hartree Fock energy plus some kind of, of perturbative potential squared and divided by an energy difference. It's taking these single and double excitations into account. It has what's a nice property, which is what's called size consistency, the energy for, for two different things. And calculate together is the same as, as the sum of the energies. CI, CI singles and doubles, does not have this property, which means that you can't do separate calculations. You have to always do the whole molecule at once. Huh? It has one bad feature. Anytime you put a, 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 a denominator with a difference of energies, you have a possibility for things to blow up. Right. And so if, if these states become degenerate, you've got infinities and, and, and the whole method just falls apart. And you can go beyond MP2, you can put 3 and 4 and so on. There's not much value in that because MPN is the M, molar placid perturbation theory does not converge, it, it rather oscillates and then diverges. MP4 is some value, but it's even of, of limited value. All right, I talked a little about singles and doubles CI. Now instead of doing it perturbatively, we're going to actually solve these equations. We're going to solve for both these coefficients as well as the coefficients of, of our orbital expansion. It lets you look at excited states. MP2 does not let you look at excited states. Hartree-Fock did not really let you look at excited states. But CI will let you look at, at excited states if you're ever interested in that. As I said, it's not size consistent. If you took the energy of of ethane and H2 
and, and, and did a, uh, of ethane and the energy of H2 and did a calculation. Then you took ethane and H2 and put them at 100 angstroms and did a calculation. Those two energies would not be the same. And so you always have to treat everything you're interested in. in, in, in. This is what I was saying before. If you go more and more excitation, you can get it to converge by going to full CI. Couple cluster. I will admit that my understanding gets a little bit weak at this point. It's it's you take it. It's got some kind of an expansion where you where you you think of the exponential operator acting on your wave function, and that gives you this this series of terms, and then by in summing up the series of terms at, at, at in a certain way, you get effectively all orders of, of excitations, but only for certain types of expansions. I know that's very poor description. You should read the books and try and, 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 and rationalize it yourself. But, but the point is, by getting infinite order sums in there analytically, you get much higher accuracy than you do with standard singles and doubles. So CCSD is, is much better than either MP2 or CISD. The parentheses T means not only are we going to do single and double excitations, we're also going to do triple excitations. And triple excitations turn out to be absolutely essential to doing chemistry. And that's why MP2 and CISD don't work as well as you would like them to work. That's one of the main reasons. The reason why you put it in a parentheses is that instead of solving for the triple excitations uh, properly in an in a iterative fashion, you just make a perturbative approximation for the triple excitation. So that's why, so you do this CCSD plus perturbative triples. You're only treating them perturbative. There's also something where it's CCSD T with no parentheses. Then you are doing the T's properly in, in iteratively. If you look at the calculation as it's going along, you'll see steps being repeated and, and as it iterates to a final solution. It turns out there's some kind of nice cancellation so that CCSD t, parentheses t is actually often better than CCSD t. Uh, it's just the right cancellation of, a, of, of approximation. And that's a common thing in electronic structure theory. You, 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 you want to you take things into account sort of in just the right way and have the right neglect of positive and negative errors. But that's one of the fortunate things about CCSD. You can keep this going with this series too. You can go CCSD T parentheses Q. You can go CCSD T Q parentheses P. If you get to that far, you will have accuracies that are on the order of a, a tenth of a kcal or less, uh, for or maybe even a hundredth of a kcal for, for most any system. It's really, really expensive though to do a CCSD T Q parentheses P. If you try to do a CCSD TQ P calculation on methane, it will take, with a, say a double zeta basis set, it will take multiple days to do just one energy with that method. But it's a, it's a great benchmark method. One measure of whether or not you expect hartree fock based methods, and all the things we've been talking about so far are sort of hartree fock based methods, single reference based methods, is to look at something called the T1 diagnostic. Other people like to look at the spin contamination. That's also another, another measure, but I find this to be more meaningful. And if it's less than about 0.02 and it's a closed shell, you're probably in good shape. Less than about 0.03 radicals, you're in good shape. Your errors are, are less than you care about as a combustion chemist. If it's greater than 0.06, it's a catastrophe. You shouldn't basically believe anything that the numbers are coming out. Somewhere in between, you have to scratch your head and ask yourself, should I be concerned or not? Most things are fall in this category, but not everything. Probably 0.04 is mostly all right too, but it's sometimes not so good. Depends a little bit on how high an accuracy you're trying to achieve. So I talked a little bit about Popol basis sets, a much better set of basis sets that, that people use now for doing quantitative work is something called the correlation consistent polarized valence basis sets. These are made by Dunning. Tom Dunning actually was at Argonne National Lab a long time ago. He's been around at, at, at basically all the national labs doing different things. But he's, he's been one of the leaders in, in, in doing really high quality electronic structure work. And what's the, one of the nice features about this 
is, is, is that this sequence, as you vary this value of n here, 2 means double, 3 means triple, 4 quadruple, 5 quintuple zeta, you get you gradually approach the answer in sort of an exponential fashion. So, so you, you, you have a sense of what your, what your level of accuracy is by looking at how you converge. And you can do extrapolations of your energies then and get a sense of, 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 of how close you are to the final answer by watching how it converges. One thing that many people forget, there was somebody in our audience that wanted, oh, I don't know if he's in the audience that I was talking to yesterday, wants to do sulfur. For sulfur, for some odd reason, in other third row atoms, you have to have an extra function. They call it plus D. It's, a, it's an extra set of tight functions if you want to have any level of accuracy. So for example, if you, if you did a, a triple zeta calculation for most molecules, you'll have errors of a kcal or two, sort of typically, maybe even three, but, but not too much more than that. If you do a, a, a CCPVTZ for a sulfur, you can have 10 or 20 kcal errors commonly. And so you have to add these plus D functions for sulfur if you're going to worry about it, or, or other third row atoms. Diffuse functions, again, valuable if you're going to think about, about uh, charged species. They're, they're also valuable if you're going to try and do things with only a double zeta. If you do only a double zeta basis, you really should be putting diffuse functions in. Uh, but by the time you get to triple zeta, their limited value because you've already got most of what you need to get into the, into, into the diffuse from your triple zeta thing. I probably should have said a word or two what about what I mean by valence zeta. Uh, your, your valence orbitals are the, are the orbitals that correlate with the electrons in their uh, their highest uh, states. So, so maybe it's easier to describe by going the, the, the opposite of valence is core. Core is ones that are down at, at the, the lower energies, things like the 1s's in, in, of, of carbon, or if you're in the third row, the 1s's and the 2s's and the 2p's, things below the, the last level that you occupy in the, in the periodic chart. We probably don't have a periodic chart. Um, and what this means is you're adding more and more functions to describe those valence orbitals. The valence orbitals are the ones that determine your chemistry. And so it's really important to have a good description of those. And that's what these, these series are doing, are, are expanding the treatment of those valence orbitals. As you try to go to higher accuracy, you, you want to worry some about the core orbitals. And if you want to think about core uh, valence interactions, you need to have different basis functions. These particular, this particular description here lets you treat valence core interactions, core correlation. The correlation energy is defined in general as a difference between the energy you get when you go beyond Hartree-Fock and the energy you get with Hartree-Fock. So the difference between MP2 and Hartree-Fock is called the core is called the correlation energy. The core correlation energy is, is what happens when you include the core electrons in your, in your treatment. When you do metals, when you do, uh, then, then there are, uh, you have to start to worry about relativistic effects. Relativistic effects can be very important for metals. And then you have to properly treat them, and that's a very challenging problem. Uh, a good approximate way to do that is through what they call effective core potentials. And that uh, greatly simpl simplifies the calculation and, 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 and still does a reasonable job of treating uh, relativistic effects for things like heavy metals. A new type of calculation, a new type of basis set, involves something called an F12 method. With the F12 method, you, uh, let me back up. One of the problems with standard basis sets and standard methods is that when the electrons get close to, to the nucleus, to the, so, that, so the radius gets close to zero, they don't, there, there is a cusp in the, in the wave function. And the standard basis sets have no way of dealing with that cusp. The standard methods don't deal with that cusp correctly. 
you have to go to really large basis sets before you start to get something that properly treats that cusp for the zero value of the separation between the electron and the nucleus. These F12 methods, you know, you, so you just add a dash F12 at the end of whatever method you're using, deals analytically with that cusp. There are special basis sets that go with these F12 methods. Those special basis sets get nearly CBS results with much smaller basis sets. You basically buy yourself one step in the, in the expansion series by going to F12 methods. It costs maybe twice as much in CPU, but you've gone up by one or more, or more in your basis set series. So it's, it's a more cost-effective way to, to get to the CBS limit, and it tends to be much more uh, reliable and effective. Uh, we're supposed to be stopping at two. Oh, I've got only two pages left. So let's, can I, if you don't mind, we'll just continue. Oh. I should have. Been There's both commercial and freeware software packages. Like anything, the commercial software packages tend to be much easier to use, right? Because they're paid, they've got, they're, you know, they're, they're, but it's a question whether you can afford it or not. The world standard electronic structure code is Gaussian. If you're unfortunate, you'll be at, a, at an institute where you've been banned by Gaussian and you can't use Gaussian. There's, there's some weird historical thing where, where Gaussian doesn't let other people that develop, institutes that have people that develop electronic structure methods use their code. So uh, Gaussian was started by John Popel. He passed it on to a student. The student and him had some falling out. And so John Popel was the first person that was banned by Gaussian. And, <laughs> and there's other places. People like Martin Head Gordon, who I mentioned here, has a code here. He's banned by Gaussian. Anna Krylov at USC is banned by Gaussian. And, and Fritz Schaefer at Georgia is banned by there's, there's, I'm listing a few. There's probably hundreds of, of, of places that are, there are often ways around that. Uh, you can make special arrangements with them and they might do something, I don't know. But this is the world standard. It's really great at almost everything, but it's not necessarily the best at anything. There may be some things it's best at, I don't know. I use it routinely for DFT geometry optimizations. It's really great at optimizing geometries and, 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 and the, the input is, is as trivial as can be. When I want to do higher level calculations, I use a code called MALPRO. Uh, it is really good at couple cluster evaluations, quite a bit faster. It's what, what's, what makes it an absolute requirement for me. If you want to do multi-reference calculations, we'll get into these a little bit. CASPD2, multi-reference CI, it is probably the best code for, for those as well. It is not great at DFT. It doesn't have analytic second derivatives. Gaussian has analytic second derivatives. Analytic derivatives immensely speed up the calculation, and they also make it much more stable. It doesn't have analytic first derivatives even for CCSD parentheses T, which is unfortunate, but is reality. Another code, Head Gordon made this code called QChem. I think it's a great code probably, but I've never used it, so I can't really. But I, 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 knowing how Head Gordon does things in his background, I suspect it would be a very good code. I have heard good things about it, but I haven't not yet. Freeware codes. One that I'm using and, and probably will start using more and more is C4. This is a code from John Stanton. Uh, John Stanton worked with Rod Bartlett. Rod Bartlett was one of the originators of coupled cluster theory. They are supposed to have very soon a very efficient version of coupled cluster theory and something that parallelizes well. MALPRO's coupled cluster parallelizes to about 10 processors and as Gaussian's does as well. But in the future, we're going to be trying to parallelize to hundreds of them, to thousands or, or more sorts of nodes and, and they don't do that very well. Another really great code, that, but that's really time consuming, is, is an MRCC code. It lets us do CCSDT parentheses Q, CCSDQ parentheses P calculations. 
High accuracy requires you to do that. Fritz Schaefer has a code called Psi. It has, does some things like multi-reference, couple cluster, and lots of other uh, things. At Argon, we have something called Columbus. Ron Shepard has been one of the primary developers, and it's great at doing multi-reference CIs, particularly doing analytic gradients for CIs and, and non-adiabatic things. And games is a code from Mark Gordon at Iowa, uh, Ames National Lab, and it does a lot of general purpose things, including fragment molecular orbitals. NW code is another national lab code. Its main claim to fame is, is being able to use massively parallel simulations. All right, let's have a break now then. Oh, I don't guess I'm supposed to take questions. Maybe, maybe we'll start with questions after the break. <laughs>